soul? Is this something in our brain? Is it something in a different dimension? The best way that I can be fulfilled is if I care for you. The title of my talk is Knowing Ourselves, Caring for Others, Empathy, Intuition, and Mental Health. Three facets of knowing yourself that we're going to talk about today. Good self-care, healthy boundaries, and awareness of your thoughts. What does it mean to know thyself? And I'm going to be reading um, three cases from my book to give you a sense of the kinds of people that come into my private practice. And these are all people who I think probably you guys will relate to in some way, shape, or form. Everybody loved Bella. On top of being a devoted wife and mother of two boys, she also had a challenging career as a clinician and researcher in oncology at a prestigious medical center. Bella was exceptionally good at taking care of all the people in her life, but not so good at taking care of herself. For people in service professions, it's easy to forget that devoting your life to helping others should not mean sacrificing your own self-care. After six months of feeling absolutely burned out and empty inside, Bella came to see me. What would it mean to take radically good care of yourself, I asked her. As soon as the words left my lips, Bella looked as startled as if I told her Martians had landed in New York City. Amazingly enough, this woman who had devoted her life to finding myriad ways to take care of others had never thought about taking good care of herself. In our subsequent sessions, we explored this question. Once she turned her attention to it, Bella had a host of ideas. Soon she was taking concrete steps to implement her answers, getting more rest every day, making time for herself, beginning the meditation practice she'd wanted to begin years back, reducing her research responsibilities so she could focus on the clinical work she so loved, and enjoying an occasional leisurely lunch with friends. In the years since, Bella's energy has changed in remarkable ways. When she was out of sync with her own implicit core values, caring only for others, she was constantly feeling drained. By caring for herself too, she removed the obstacle that was obstructing the power of her authentic self. Today it's possible to tell at a glance that Bella is no longer feeling tired and empty. She is every bit as busy as before, but now she is radiant. For Bella, she listed those things for her after we started considering what would radical self-care mean that were important to her. But for everybody it's different, and there really isn't a prescription for good self-care, even though many people can give you lists of what it means to have a balanced life. So the idea with this is the importance of looking within yourself and knowing yourself to understand what does self-care mean to you. This is Dr. Hinohara. He was a physician who just passed away at the age of 105 in Japan. A man who implemented regular health checks in Japan and was one of the proponents of longevity. He worked up until a few months prior to his death at the age of 105 and continued to see patients up until 104. This man has a lot to teach us on longevity, self-care, and how to live a balanced life. So what did balance mean to this person? Balance to this man meant working an 18-hour day almost every day, often skipping meals and not getting enough sleep, according to our definition of that, because he loved his job so much and felt such a sense of purpose that this is what he got his meaning from. This was balance, and this man lived till 105. I show this because what everybody needs to feel good and healthy and take care of themselves and therefore be able to take good care of others is really, really different. What Dr. Hinohara needed is very different from what Bella needed, which is very different from probably what each of you need, which is why it's so important to figure out what is it that you need in order to live the best life possible and thereby also be the best doctor. The next topic I want to talk about is creating healthy boundaries because essentially your boundaries are where you end and where another begins. And with every person, we're always negotiating and renegotiating our boundaries, especially with the people closest to us. The question always is, how close is too close? How far is too far? So we're in the stands trying to figure out what are the right boundaries? How do I keep enough distance to still maintain who I am without merging with you necessarily, except to the degree that I want to merge with you? And then how do I actually stay close enough to you to still actually be close without distancing yourself too much? In talking about boundaries, I want to share another case for my private practice. And this is the case of Suzanne. Something bad is going to happen. 
Suzanne had always had premonitions. From an early age, she knew when something bad would happen. A tingling feeling would start in her chest, then spread to her arms, down her torso to her legs, until her whole body tingled with anxious anticipation. Along with it came a premonition of some fearful thing about to happen to someone she knew. A car accident, an unexpected death, a disaster of some kind. The tingling wouldn't relent until she got word that her fears were confirmed, usually within 24 hours. I don't want to know when something bad is going to happen, she told me when she sought therapy for this unusual symptom. I just want to live my life like everybody else. Suzanne believed that she'd inherited her psychic gift from her mother, who always magically knew when something was wrong with her, one of her four children. When Suzanne got into a car accident in college, her mom had an intense chest pain that signaled to her something was wrong with Suzanne. Before Suzanne could even reach her mom and tell her what happened, mom was on a plane to visit Suzanne. Suzanne's grandmother and great-grandmother both had the same premonitions. Why am I telling you about premonitions and things like this on a talk about boundaries? When you think about boundaries and you think about empathy, you can think of them actually on a continuum. Here, if you have very, very strong boundaries, such strong boundaries, you might not really be able to feel another person. You could sympathize, but it's harder to empathize. Empathize is almost being able to merge for a second, to know what they're feeling, to be able to put yourself in their shoes. And people have different capacities for this. Some people have to cultivate the capacity to be empathic, and this is something that they work on throughout their lives. But a lot of doctors, actually, who come into medicine are on this other spectrum. And this is the spectrum where Suzanne finds herself. She is what we call an empath or an intuitive empath. Her boundaries are a lot more permeable to the extent that she can feel what other people are feeling and know a lot of things about them, often without even knowing why. And people like this, on this side of the spectrum, often have these premonitions, kind of these psychic things. As I got to know Suzanne, I realized that these premonitions with which she came to me were actually just the tip of the iceberg. She had so many other symptoms that as I tried to understand what was going on with her, I read about it and these are kind of the qualities of these empaths. They're very good at picking up the subtleties and nuances of other people. They're very good at empathizing. They're going to know what you're feeling without you having to say a word. Often they're going to go into psychiatry. People like this also could, as Suzanne had, have uncanny knowing about certain things. Like Suzanne would be standing with someone, she'd know the name of their child and have no idea why. She would be able to know what they're feeling to the point where she would actually start feeling it herself. And that's where the boundaries break down. Some people, their boundaries are a little bit more permeable and they can actually take on much more than your average person. So Suzanne is all the way on this side of the spectrum and here's this other very strict boundaries you know, category. And as I was reading and trying to understand this, I learned that a number of people have actually studied this very phenomenon and have many different classification systems to describe it. One such classification system is the orchids versus the dandelions. And this is in a paper published in 2005 by Boyce and Willis that described children in one of two categories. 80% of children were more like dandelions, meaning they were a little bit more sturdy and resilient. Their boundaries were a little bit more set. They could generally survive and do well in most environments, provided that the environments weren't excessively harsh. On the other side of the spectrum were the other 20%. These were the orchids. The orchids were much more sensitive, and especially sensitive to the quality of parenting they had early on. In difficult circumstances, orchids were much more likely to wilt, much more so than the dandelions. But in the right environment, in an environment that really nurtured who they were, they actually had the capacity to surpass the dandelions in their ability, becoming a flower of unusual and rare delicacy. A lot of doctors, especially psychiatrists, are these orchids, and Suzanne was very much an orchid. And there's a lot of other classification systems similar to this, including highly sensitive people, like HSPs. This is a new classification that was created by Elaine Aaron, uh, a psychologist, 
to also understand these are individuals who on brain scans show enhanced activation in the areas for empathy, awareness, and attention than your ordinary person. They have much more perceptual abilities when it comes to how others are feeling. Usually they're much more creative and they're much more sensitive to what's going on around them in general. Going back to the premonitions that my patient Suzanne presented with, from a purely psychodynamic standpoint, premonitions could be your repressed fears, your inner conflicts, the things that you're trying unconsciously to reconcile. And so these premonitions also, from this standpoint, could just be Suzanne's ways of retrospectively rationalizing what happened to her after the fact. For her, the idea was really premonitions don't happen before an event. They're just things we construct in our mind after the fact. And certainly Suzanne and I explore this possibility. Perhaps these are just retrospective rationalizations. But then things would happen to Suzanne during the course of our therapy, and we both really thought there was more going on here. How do you help someone who is a little bit too permeable to the energy of others? And this was Suzanne. So what we ultimately did, we really focused on boundary setting. That was the majority of our treatment. I taught her how to be able to set clear boundaries, knowing where she ends and where another begins. So these intuitive hunches and premonitions which used to drain her energy started to become something she was able to externalize and see more neutrally. The final topic is becoming aware of your thoughts. And as you can see, the Buddha said, your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own unguarded thoughts. Essentially, our life really is first and foremost in our own mind. You know, they say that the mind can make a heaven or hell of things. This is from the Bible. You can really create in your mind a beautiful world or a very difficult world. For this particular topic, I want to read a little section in my book about Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor. In Man's Search for Meaning, Viennese psychiatrist Dr. Viktor Frankl talks about being in the concentration camps in World War II. One of the most startling things he observed was that what people thought determined whether or not they survived. The external circumstances were the same for everybody, but the thoughts people dwelled on were quite different. Frankel watched as many prisoners became sick with malaria, while others remained healthy. Some deliberately ran into electric wires to electrocute themselves to death, while others chose to remain alive. The conditions, as we know today, were so horrific that it would be understandable for every prisoner to suffer miserably. Yet Frankel tells us from firsthand experience that some were able to remain amazingly cheerful and positive much of the time. While in the camps, Frankel observed hundreds of fellow prisoners and came to this powerful and poignant realization. Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Everybody was exposed to treacherous, dangerous, difficult circumstances, but some people persevered because of the power of their own mind. Let's talk a little bit about thoughts. There's so much written about the power of the mind. The mind-body connection is so powerful, which is why techniques like mindfulness, yoga, and meditation are used more and more. The average person thinks about 72 to 74,000 thoughts per day, many of them automatic, unconscious. That's a lot of thoughts. And I see actually a lot of people in my private practice who come to me because of issues with thinking. They could be obsessed. They are in love with someone and the other person is unavailable somehow. And the thought goes on and on and on. Thoughts also are what lead to depression. Thoughts also are what lead to anxiety. Cognitive distortions are something that every human being has to some degree. And this is the way in which our thoughts actually could be different from the reality. I mean, after all, what is reality? Really, our external world is a product of the way that we subjectively view that world. Our external world is a product of our internal mind, which is why knowing thyself comes back. The way you see your world is a product of your own lens. Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. This is not to say you shouldn't acknowledge the thought and actually listen to it. But if it happens over and over, 
a phenomenon could happen which is catastrophizing, which is a very powerful cognitive distortion that's probably the number one cognitive distortion I see in my private practice. I'm sure it's something we've all done where we have a fear of something and we keep thinking about it over and over and with every thought it gets more treacherous. The guy's not gonna call me, he's gonna dump me. Oh my God, my presentation's gonna go horribly. I'm gonna get kicked out of medical school. I'm gonna get an A minus instead of an A. Whatever it is, <laughs> whatever your loop is, those are cognitive distortions and the power of the mind to catastrophize. The summary of this is that you're in a profession of taking care of others. The cardinal rule of taking care of others is you must take care of yourself first. And this is like they tell you in the airplanes. Put on your own air mask before you put on your child's. Some of you can say, but how can I do that? That's selfish. The reality is that unless you take care of yourself, you're not gonna be much use to your patients or your family members or your friends or anybody else in your life. Taking care of others requires consistent self-care, setting good boundaries, and being aware of your thoughts. If there's any more questions, we'll do them later. Thank you so much.